one of the things that we're quite often asked, in fact, I had a conversation with a woman from Belfast this afternoon, is what do we mean by co-creation and how do we define it? I think it's how long is a piece of string, really, is, is the simple answer, or maybe my best simple answer is, I think co-creation is doing with and not doing to. But my colleague, Liz, who I'm actually doing maternity cover for at Battersea Arts Centre, wrote this brilliant speech and I've pinched it because I couldn't write it any better. So I'm just going to read it out. And I'm also happy to put it in the chat. The definition of co-creation is contested. And more recently, as co-creation has been on the upswing, it's fast becoming a word that many people use to mean many different things. We think of co-creation as sitting on a scale which has community-led on one side and top-down institution-led on the other. Community consultation, community involvement and community participation are all on this scale. However, we are really interested in exploring the practice which sits in the middle of this scale and brings together a wide range of partners on an equal footing and makes the best of everyone's skills, networks, knowledge and experience. We're not saying that these other kinds of practice aren't extremely valuable, but they're just not what we're exploring through the co-creating change network. Of course, bringing people together to create on an equal footing is a very powerful, but often difficult thing to do and potentially easy to abuse. How do people come together on an equal footing in a world where power, privilege, agency and vested interests play a huge role in human relationships and dynamics? We're really interested in sharing and exploring effective methodologies and approaches which can create the right conditions for co-creation. One of the reasons for setting up this um, meeting today is that there's definitely an interest to see if we can help support regional networks and, and look at what resource and support those regional networks can be and how we may be able to support each other regionally to find out who is involved in co-creation in the region and, and who isn't, and to find out what everyone might want from a regional network and from the Battersea Arts Centre point of view, how we might be able to support that. So, yeah, I hope that's given a bit of an overview. For what I'd like to do now is I'd like to hand over to Christina from Strike a Light, who's going to talk a little bit about, about co-creation. Thanks, Christina. So, yeah, as we've said a couple of times, there's not currently one definitive, this is co-creation. So for Strike a Light, we work in Gloucester and we work with artists and communities creating projects and events, and that's usually in non-theatre spaces. And so I've been trying to think recently about how, what are the kind of defining things for us about co-creation? And so it usually comes up in conversations around co-creation, community-led work, participation, engagement, outreach, those kinds of words. And I think for us, all of those words are about different ways of articulating the relationship between who's involved in something. So the relationship between artists and communities and organisations. And the differences in those ways of working then often comes down to some quite simple questions. So things like who is creating the art? Who is it for? Who's holding the decision making power? Those kind of questions. For us at Strike a Light, our approach is about focusing on the idea in the name of co-creation. So creating something together. So us as an organisation, communities and artists coming together equally to create something. And for us, the two key things out of that is the timeline and the decision making. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. So here's a selection of different things that happen in a project or different aspects or components um, that might come up in a project. So budget, location, who the creative team are, who's producing it, partners who you're working with, the art form or the creative idea itself, and what the outputs or outcomes for the project are. So in terms of timeline, if as a project, 
you kind of are working through a timeline and you start the project and you kind of plan all of those things and make decisions about all of those things. And then the last bit of it, which depending on your screen setup might be hidden behind people's faces, but the last bit of it I've put there is engagement. So if the last bit of it then is about engaging with the people you want to co-create with, for us that isn't co-creation from a strike alike perspective because it's about creating all of those things together. And then the other thing is the decision-making power. So out of all those things, again, the same different project components, asking ourselves who has the decision-making power over those things. So is it that that decision-making is shared? Are some of those things decided by us and some of those things decided by who we're co-creating with? And the ideal is that that decision-making is shared on most of those things. So if when we go through it, there's only a couple of things that it's shared on, then that's not necessarily the kind of strongest way of co-creating from our perspective. So I'm just gonna stop sharing that. So for us, that's the two key things is about when people are involved in the timeline and how decision-making is shared. So as an example, in a little bit, you'll be hearing from Aisha and Halima, who we've been co-creating together on a project that some aspects were set kind of out of necessity. So the overall budget was set because of the amount of funding that we had for it. But within that, the majority of the decision making about the different roles that people took, the content of the project, what it was, how it worked, what the outcomes were, that, that decision making was shared. And I'm just going to finish off with a little analogy. And I was trying to, to think of a way of explaining that. And the one that I've come up with is sandwiches. So as an example, thinking about sandwiches, if you were going to Subway, theoretically, other sandwich shops are available. Theoretically, you have lots of choice because you make all the decisions about your sandwich. So they say, what kind of bread do you want? And what filling do you want? But actually Subway decided on all of those options before you got there. So they created the structure. So by the time you come to the shop, they've already chosen the types of bread, what the fillings are, how much it's gonna cost, where it is, the opening times, what you're allowed to make decisions on. And so you're choosing within a structure that's created by someone else. So for me, the kind of co-creation version of sandwiches is, well, what if you want a bagel or what if you want a wrap or what if you have an amazing bread recipe that you could share with them or what if you hate sandwiches or what if you have an idea for a sandwich that no one's ever eaten before or you want to invite friends and family around to make bread together. So Subway is efficient for making sandwiches, but it's never going to be like the best or most exciting sandwich of your life. So if you were involved in all stages of the process and you were working alongside expert bakers and growers to get the best ingredients, sharing your skills and ideas, then you could create the sandwich of your dreams. So for me, co-creation is basically making the sandwich of your dreams. And on that very deep philosophical note, I'm going to pass over to Martha. Thanks, Christina. I love that. <laughs> OK, I'm going to now talk a little bit about the Media Centre's co-creation approach. I'm just going to share my screen. OK, so for those of you who may not know, Norwest Media Centre is an arts and digital organisation with over 20 years experience of co-creating with people to make positive changes in their lives. I'm going to talk about our approach to co-creation but first of all I'm going to give you a bit of context about where the organisation is based and how we started as this feels especially important when we're talking about co-creation. So for those of you who maybe don't know Bristol, Noel West is in the south at the edge of the city has a, approximately 5,000 households. Norwest ranks highly on deprivation indices. This 
disadvantage is extreme and real. However, it's only part of the story of Noah West. Scratch the surface and there's so much more going on. Uh, Noah West Media Centre didn't start as a centre, but actually started as a photography arts residency, exploring health issues set up in 1996 by the director, Carolyn Hassan, when she set, went and set up a darkroom. And this grew to include filmmaking, with Penny Evans and Carolyn Hassan co-creating films and photography with young community members. Then, when the young people involved decided they needed more space to do creative projects, they began to dream big and worked with architects, staff and community members to co-design and fundraise for a centre to be built. Okay, so it didn't end up looking like this, but in 2008, this building on the, on the left there is, was built and now including studio space, training and meeting rooms. If young people and community hadn't been there to drive the, the co-creation, then funders and council would have won the day and it would have been made the cheapest way possible out of breeze blocks. Instead, because of that co-creation process, we have a real flagship straw bale eco building that the whole community can be proud of. And on the right there is the factory, our digital maker space based at Philwood Green Business Park. As you can see, the organization has grown from the needs of the community. Back when we first started, it was about putting camera technology in people's hands to empower them to co-create. Now, more than 20 years on, those tools have expanded to include everything from digital fabrication, coding and data, but it's always the same mission, to provide tools and opportunities to co-create and explore creative ways of doing things differently and living better together. So how would we define co-creation? I think it could be useful to refer to a chapter we recently published in a book, co-creation in theory and practice, where we define co-creation as a cooperative process whereby people with common interests, often with diverse skills and experiences, work together non-hierarchically towards a change they want to bring about. In this chapter, we explore some of the challenges, possibilities, and limitations of co-creation, suggesting that positive social change can be enabled by co-creation processes that follow these principles. Start with people and their interest. And of course, people's passions and interests will be surprising and diverse. From a place of valuing people's knowledge and skills, like this University of Local Knowledge project made with artist Suzanne Lacey, which included over 1000 videos of local people sharing their specialist knowledge. By going out and meeting people where they are and really listening, we believe you can then begin to enter a process of co-creation and work towards a shared goal. We think this is really important in order to enable the non-hierarchical practice of co-creation collaborating to create a common goal around which people from all different backgrounds can cluster, gives focus and energy. So that at the start of every project, it's essential to give time to defining and co-creating a shared mission of change. And then with this clear headline, people can then contribute as much as they want, knowing they're moving towards an agreed shared goal. This is the Bristol approach framework I thought I'd just quickly point towards this. It's a process for co-creating with the idea of the commons at the heart of it. But I'll post more information about that. So using creative approaches and arts practice to work across disciplines and power structures. To enable co-creation to work, everyone has to have a willingness to contribute, as well as the agency and the possibility to take part. We find creative facilitators play a key role in ensuring that co-creation is possible. Artists are often employed as facilitators using tactics of play and sensory engagement to cross boundaries, remove fear and create spaces where change can happen. 
artists also bring amazing problem solving skills and creative thinking, asking everyone the what if questions and ultimately leading to more engaging outcomes. And through creative approaches, we can also create spaces to imagine new futures and how things could be different. Whether that's developing new citizen led approaches to designing and making homes, through young people designing social action campaigns or artists coming together to sleep overnight in an old school gym imagining what an artist hotel might look like and finally democratizing and demystifying the tools and means of production so by taking away the mystery behind tech tools opening dialogue around things like how facebook uses our data and skilling people up to hack code and access existing open source tools. To use digital fabrication tools like laser cutters, 3D printing and CNC machines, people can become more informed and empowered to build the tools and spaces we need to live better together. Ensuring that new tech developments don't just happen with, early, with the early adopters or in research environments, but instead in and with communities where those most in need are able to be involved right from the start. The latest example of this could be the Making Together for Everyone project, which happened in spring 2020 and involved a group of local No West residents coming together to explore the future of housing and resulted in Block West, a pop-up pavilion, which is currently up outside No West Media Centre. Since it's been up, it's been used for everything from workshops to artist residencies to a silent disco. But I'm not going to say much more about this process as we've got some participants here who are going to tell you a bit more about that later. I loved your headlines, Martha. I thought that was fantastic. And I think it's almost like a kind of manifesto for co-creation. It'd be great if you could share those somehow. That'd be wonderful. I'll quote you. We're going to have a 20 minute blast of inspiration now, which will hopefully provoke lots of questions and discussions. So we've invited some brilliant guests just to share examples of how they're co-creating. And the first guest is guests are the Onion Collective. So I'm going to hand over to Sally now. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Sally Lowndes from the Onion Collective. I am. Um, a middle-aged woman <laughs> with uh, brown shoulder length hair and yellow earrings and a black and white top. And I am now going to share my screen. So just bear with me for a second. Uh, can everyone see that? And oops. All right. So I don't have long to talk. I've only got five minutes. So I'm just going to give you uh, a really brief summary of our journey at Onion Collective and our journey around co-creation. And I'm actually, I'm going to try and be really candid because I think this is quite difficult ground and I don't think we've necessarily always got it right. But we've been on this journey for a while now, so we've had time to reflect and appreciate where we could perhaps have improved our practice. So like many of you, I'm sure, I always tell my children to embrace their failures because that's where the real learning happens. And plus, I think it's important and cath cathartic to be honest about this stuff. So that's what I'm going to try and be. So I hope be nice to me. So, yeah, so Onion Collective is a social enterprise in West Somerset. We're concerned with the narrative of place and the associated economics of attachment. So we believe that this e uh, attachment is fundamental to the creation of a new and better future because it's the ties we have to place and those around us that make our actions kind of tangible. And it's at this level that we're reminded to care. So before I start, I think I should explain a little bit about Watch It because context is everything. So Watch It is a really beautiful and tight community nestled between the Quantock Hills and Exmoor. Well, those of us who live here absolutely love it. If you look at the traditional metrics, it's clear that we're struggling within the prevailing economic system. So we've got some of the lowest wages, SME productivity and social mobility in the entire country. 
So this is because we're far away from any centres of commerce, we're coastal, we're rural, so simply we lack opportunities. However, this is compensated by our off the chart social capital, which means in this town that's just shy of 5,000 people, everyone knows each other, we have no crime, and someone's always got your back. But this social currency that binds us can also be quite tribal. And this, I think, is what makes co-creation hard. Sorry, not ready for that yet. Um, so, because so, this is how social capital works. On one level, it's all about the bonds that tie us together and cause us to form clusters. But a successful community will also have lots of the people who can bridge those groups together and make them work as a whole ecosystem. These bridging people are essential. So at Onion Collective, we're working really hard to deliver an extremely ambitious portfolio of projects with and for our community in Watch It. And this started with a two month long consultation period. And this was about eight years ago where we asked everyone in our town what they felt we needed for a stronger future. So from here, we developed our shared town priorities and started with, which started with strengthening our tourist offer and creating jobs. So we began developing our first projects in response. And project one was this, it was a purpose-built visitor centre. So this, the town already had a tourist information centre office but this was cramped and cold and hadn't, didn't have any tech. So really it was just a space for volunteers to share leaflets and local knowledge. The chair of the group said they desperately needed a new and better premises and an upgrade in tech, in tech to enable them to do their jobs better in the 21st century. And so with tourism, the key issue in the town response, we decided to go ahead and try and make it happen. So we raised the funds, hired an architect, drew up the plans and started the build. However, <laughs> during this time, the chair very sadly and suddenly passed away and the new chair felt very differently about the new centre. He felt that the TIC office, TIC office was still needed and decided to keep it open so that its volunteers would stay with them and not move into the new centre with us. So instead of having one upgraded inclusive centre, we had two centres and a symbol of division. So we didn't have a natural bridge to this group anymore, and it's taken us five years to win back the trust of some of these members of the community. So for us, this project really represents our steepest learning curve. We learned that co-creation means so much more than consultation. It means putting everything into relationships, because in a community like ours, losing a key member of a bonded group, our bridge, meant we lost the whole group. So the visitor centre is now the inclusive centre it was always meant to be and acts as a community hub as well as a centre for tourism. And key to this has been employing an extraordinary centre manager with more of this kind of bridging social capital, this is her Fiona on the left, than just about anyone in the town. She connects all the different groups. She's, she knows everyone and just is the absolute, you know, just a wonderful person to, to, to have in there. So I don't have time to share too much, too many, too, too many projects and learning. So from here, I'm just gonna to skip to East Quay. So East Quay is a cultural development on our quay side, consisting of a two-story gallery, 14 workshop spaces, a print studio, handmade paper mill, geology lab, restaurant, and five B&Bs on stilts on the roof. So designed again in response to the town's ideas and input, and to develop a small-scale shipping container pilot project on the, on the site called Contains Art, East Key has been seven years in the making and it is now finally being built. It's designed to be an all year round attraction and community space. With East Key, the community has been much more involved throughout the design process. So we've had five rounds of feedback on the designs, creating an iterative approach for our long suffering architect. And through this process, we also brought in a team of local ambassadors from all corners of the community, bribing them with cake and coffee um, to ensure a deeper two way conversation was created with as many mem with, with all members of the town. So these guys essentially acted as our, our community bridges. So it was really important that we identified people who ca carried weight within their own sort of bonded groups. We've also done loads of work with local schools, making art the fun and accessible subject it could be, should be, sorry, and ensuring that local kids are growing up knowing that this space is for them. And local teenagers are currently involved in designing the education space in collaboration with the design team so that they will have a lasting tangible input and pride in their own contribution to the town. So events have also, 
So events have also been a really useful engagement tool and having contains art, our small scale, oops, our small scale pilot project in place for seven years has created an un unintimidating space for gradual introduction of ideas. This has been particularly useful for families. As kids meet and work with us through school projects, we then back this work up with free family events on the quay sides, with barbecues, music, fun creative activities, meaning that kids have dragged their parents along and helped open it up to them, demonstrating that this really is a community space, because it's only by actively participating that people have been able to truly believe this. So for all of the key tenants, they're parts of the development of Bespoke, and in return, they're agreeing to give back to the community with open events, workshops, and an open door policy. Together, we are creating opportunities, pride, and togetherness. But gallery space is still an intimidating concept for some here, so we are by no means at our final destination. And with this in mind, our first exhibition at East Quay is on community. And artist Neville Gaby has asked the local um, has asked local people to contribute and inspire his work by creating their own, putting what they feel is the essence of Watch It into a bottle. This process is again helping to create connections where there were barriers. So, in summary, co-creation is difficult, really difficult, because when you're working in a community, the stakes are high. The ties that um, the ties that root us to place can be as complicated and charged as those that tie us to our families because community relationships are complex human ecosystems developed over time, working symbiotically with their places. So perhaps the best thing we've done um, so far as a group has been to seed an entirely different group called the Watch It Coastal Communities Team. So this was a government, government initiative to help coastal communities come together to create their own economic strategies in response to this kind of trajectory of sharp decline of, these, of our coastal places over the past decades. And this group now here in Watch It now consists of over 30 local organisations and that includes all three tiers of local government, local businesses, charities, community groups, social enterprises, public sector institutions, you know, they're all represented here. So it's a deeply democratic space with monthly meetings, working groups and a, and a huge array of projects each group's representative becomes their bridge to the rest of the community, helping to strengthen our place and our collective ability to change our narrative to one of opportunity and hope. So Onion is just one member group here in the CCT. And here we can ask for feedback, support and collaboration in a safe and connected space. So just my key message in summary, I'm off now, is that relationships matter. So nurture every single one of them because these invisible ties charge our physical ones. The projects we deliver are given meaning and value by the people who engage in them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I hand over to Making Together, which, yeah, John and Megan, thank you very much. Hello. Hello, uh, my name's John Bennett, I'm a middle-aged Bristol man, I'm wearing glasses, I've got short brown hair and I'm wearing a brown cardigan. Uh, just want to introduce myself. I joined Making Together, the Making Together project, which is a collaboration between um, Northwest Media Centre and Automated Architecture. It came out of another project called the We Can Make project, which I've been a member of now for probably over two years. The We Can Make Community project, a project is a community housing trust trying to bridge the gap between the shortfall in affordable, uh, affordable housing in the West. There is houses being built in the West, as whether they're affordable is another question. And my situation, I'm currently uh, between homes. I'm living in a, a, a temporary shepherd's hut in the centre of Bristol, uh, very, very basic conditions, and I'm living on minimum wage. So it's very difficult for me to change my, my living situation because of my uh, lifestyle and everything. So the, uh, it was very good for me to join the We Can Make project. And the Making Together workshop was based around teaching the community to, to use modern methods of construction to build, to build their own houses in the We Can Make project. So that, that's me, and I'll just hand you over to Megan now, who's going to introduce herself and give you her own background. Thanks, John. I'm Megan Clark-Bagnall. 
I'm a visual artist and social maker. I live in the West. And John and I joked that we would come today in matching outfits. But I just realized from looking at him that we do have matching glasses. So I, a 34 year old who looks like a 34 year old or older, I've got mousy brown hair that was one half bleached blonde, but it grew out during lockdown a bit. And I'm wearing lipstick that's pink. Yeah, I'm a visual artist and social maker. I believe in radical ripples, taking silliness seriously and validating the importance of fun and play during co-creation. Yeah, and I worked together with John on the Making Together project. And we met over the internet because this project um, started going ahead during uh, L1, lockdown one. And yeah, here's a picture of of the, the pavilion that we, we made together as it was a team of many other people. This is it in daylight as well. I'm holding up a picture which shows lots of blocks that just basically are upscaled versions of these blocks that are wooden blocks that we, that we just uh, slotted together. I say we just slotted together, that makes it sound really easy. Yeah. It, was a lot, <laughs> it was a lot of hard work. Because we haven't got very long, we're just going to um, finish up with a positive and a negative little example each. So I'll, let, I'll go to, to John for a little positive. Yeah. Sorry, to give a positive for a positive, I really had to, to think difficultly, uh, to think long and hard about this. There's so many. Because it, it switched from being a hands-on workshop, working in a, a digital, digital factory, we moved to working in, in isolation in our own places. This, this became a bit of a lifeline for me. So the, the, main, the main positive for me was my involvement, was being part of a social group, being part of a community whilst in isolation. The negatives, uh, these, this is the negatives. We were given boxes to build. Instead of building them with, a, with a, an app in, online, we were given the real, the, the real McCoy to build with. And these, I spent probably 16 hours, two rolls of sellotape, and the skin on both thumbs, trying to get these things to work, and they didn't work, I hate them, thank you. For reference, <laughs> for reference, John was holding up some cardboard boxes that we had to make to, to get an idea of what we could make with these other boxes. John hated that, mm -hmm. I really liked that, because I like making things with my hands, and also it was a heat wave during L1, so I was just sat outside with loads of sun cream on making them up, I had a really good time. In contrast to John, I am not such a big fan of technology and my laptop, well, having an artist's wage, my laptop's 16 years old. So that's what I found really frustrating about actually working through COVID times is like technology just for, yeah, if you haven't got the latest, it's terrible really. And I couldn't use the app to do mine. So yeah, and I was gonna say the biggest, like there's, there's, a couple, there's so many pluses, but I'd say the biggest plus of this project was that the community of, of makers that came together to, to build BlockQuest were everybody from, from local young mums to, to like old school joiners and carpenters, retirees, gardeners. And yeah, we were all artists in our field and we all got paid exactly the same wage and we were all exactly the set on the same even foot throughout the whole process. And that just made it so easy. And for me as an artist that normally comes in as a facilitator, like that's, you know, you want to make, yeah, it's, it was just really refreshing that everyone was just coming in with their artistry and their, their yeah, their art their artisan and bringing that to the table. Yeah, and I'd say like, yeah, we're, having worked with Norwest Media Center, it, the project worked virtually to then being in reality because they had the tech and the support to be able to like lend people laptops and bob in with those kinds of things. But the biggest thing for me is getting to know John and now John is actually having a house built out of these blocks and filled with lamb's wool. 
for insulation and, and he's going to be my neighbor he's moving like the street next to mine and he knows how to make things really well <laughs> <laughs> apart from cardboard boxes uh, yeah i'm actually uh, that's uh, this is my uh, my main my main quest is to get affordable suitable housing and working working with my community building my house you know, we're all working together building well, my house isn't even built yet and i know uh, i know it inside out i know that i know what the rooms look like i know the sizes of the place so yeah, it's been really, I mean, what, what the media centre have done, they put you in the middle of a project and they wrap everything around you and make sure you've got all the resources, and all the tools to co-create. And they've done this in partnership with automated architecture. Um, just to finish off, I've seen a quote on some graffiti on the wall today and it really, really sums up everything about the project where we worked together in the lockdown. And the quote basically went, it basically said, we may not have it all together, but all together we have it all. And that basically sums up everything for me with the with the, uh, the, the, the We Can Make project and the lockdown. It's been fantastic. It's a really, really good co-creative project. You know, I'm on with it. We can continue. Thank you. Thank you. That was totally brilliant. Oh God, I've lost myself again. Thank you so much. I'm now going to introduce Aisha and Halima from Strike Light, and I'm actually, I'm going to attempt to share a film. I don't know, I'm just going to try and do it, so bear with me, everyone. I'm just going to press it. Oh, share screen, that's what I do. I'm remembering now. Hang on. I thought I'd got this all set up. Here we go. This is a short film that was made about this project that we wanted to share with you all. And then Aisha and Halima are going to talk about how, how they work together and how they work with Strike Alight. So I invite you all to sit back for a couple of minutes and in, enjoy something that I think is really beautiful. This is just a seed that has been sown in the community with these amazing, amazing, talented women we all come from different parts of the world, but we have something that bonds us, and that's the fact that we are women and we have experiences. It's helped me to understand myself in writing, which I haven't done for 20 years. Recently, I've been going through a lot of emotions that I felt quite therapeutic to put on paper. Positive, um, I feel confident, and, and I'm raring to go. <laughs> I never thought that I would be a perfect writer. But now I am, and I can't stop writing, which is lovely. Who gave you the right to preach what you alone don't practice? Who gave you the right to raise your voice at your eldest? Then choking, choking hard on my last breath. La ilaha illa. We are mothers and daughters, wives, cousins and sisters. Some of us wear illustrations of bright, vivid colour, or some paint with just words to share ourselves with one another. I can play with the language so easy for me. My mother tongue is always there for me. This is me, this is the words I speak. Which is too much. Can you make me say, I love you too much. I want your love, your warmth, your touch, but it's too much. You never said I'm leaving. You never said goodbye. You were gone before I knew it. And, I, and only Allah knows why. I will always remember the special smile and the caring heart you always gave me. I'm feeling grateful that everyone opened up so much, uh, that everyone was really dedicated to keeping each other safe. I'm glad that we created so much work together. I'm glad that so many poems came about in each session and everyone was just open to that writing experience. I said at the start that I was feeling lost. I feel now that a part of myself has been found both by being seen and heard by these women and through being allowed to explore my own headspace through creating poetry, through words and through performing. And the project has come from the She Spoke Poetry Project and we are now going to be working on a banner. It's not just about the creative work or the poetry. For me, it's about what people put into it and 
on this occasion, people have put in their feelings, their emotions. We women are a library, a room of silent voices, an archive of boundless knowledge kept in hiding. But we are opening up, sharing hearts, a gift to each other. We are ladies of courage, strength and devotion. From Yorkshire cities to Devon nooks, all gathered in the same Gloucester house. We come from soft words, hard knocks, born with the hearts of a thousand mothers. Open, fearless and sweet, we are women of words that heal, unite and glue us together. We are multitudes, brave and bold. We are, she spoke. Thanks so much. God, I have to work out how to stop it. Hang on. There. My back. Yes. Um, sorry, technology always floors me. I'm doing remarkably well, although it might not look like it. I'd like to hand over to Halima and Aisha now just to talk about how they work together on the project. Over to you both. Hi. My name is Halima. I'm middle-aged with a lot of grey hair, which this covers very nicely. This project was something, this idea I had a good few years ago, which I had talked to Sarah about. Just the love of poetry, the love of words, the strength it's given me in my life. And I really, really wanted to put that together and when I was asked if I'd like to do a co-creative project with such a beautiful friend of mine called Aisha, we just both clicked. We just clicked. I had an idea about the banner and the poetry. We sat one day, I said it, and she took it. She took the idea and, and we ran. The whole thing just came together so beautifully and the final banner which we did with 25 women was beyond my imagination it was so nice to be able to co-create and have these ideas but to work together in a team where you've got two like-minded people who understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. And for me, that was the most important part that Aisha knew my weakness and I understood her strength and vice versa. And I think that's why the project was <clears throat> such a success and that we had seven women, including myself and Malaika on the poetry side and they all decided they wanted to be part of the banner. And Aisha then also had other women from her sewing side. And we created a diverse project with 25 women in the community. So yeah, Aisha. Thanks very much, Leva. Aisha. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Aisha. I'm Aisha Randera. I wear glasses just turned 50. I feel like I've lost out on a year though, during lockdown. I work at an organisation called the Friendship, Friendship Cafe and I was approached by Christina and Halima about this poetry project, which was going to turn into a textile banner. I run a studio a sewing studio at the Friendship Cafe, which was a little bit of a dream, but a little bit of a sort of collaboration with Emma Willis Sewing Studio. So I've done some collaborative work with other people in the past, but nothing like this, where we were all on we were all on the same level, and we were making decisions together. So it. Like I think Sally had said earlier, it wasn't all plain sailing. It was during sort of September that we started and I got sick right at the beginning. So the collaborative working and the co-creation came into play almost immediately because 
people sort of collaborated and worked together, even though, you know, I was out of action. So that was a real touching time for me. So the community that we work in, it's a very mixed community, a very small comparatively to a lot of places in the UK where minority BAME communities live. It's quite a small, small BAME community and it's quite tight knit. So if something happens, everyone knows about it, usually through my WhatsApp broadcasts. But when Halima and Striker Light approached me, I wasn't sure um, whether it was going to work with our organisation. Our organisation works very differently and it hadn't been sort of, I suppose that that sort of work hadn't been done. But was very keen to challenge not just myself, but also the people around me in working in different ways. Um, oh, gosh. So part of our project was this poetry. When that, when that sort of finished, we went into the Branner process of it. Planning stages was really difficult because lockdown happened literally, I think it was just before the last session of the poetry groups. The poetry group's last session was on Zoom and then the Banner project was literally through lockdown. But the impact it had on the people that we were working with and I include when I say working with I include the participants in this because they were an integral part if they didn't work collaboratively with us and collectively with us there would have been no banner so we had to work very differently instead of workshops we did a tutorial which Striker Light Help Us gets film, get filmed and sent that out with packages. So everything was delivered at home in a COVID safe way and then collected and then put together by another textile artist. There were issues surrounding that. One of the biggest issues was people getting COVID during their work, you know, during their time that they had the project and the touching and collecting of stuff. So it had to be managed sort of quite carefully without letting people know who those people were and keeping confidentiality in a small community like ours everyone knows each other although in that particular group we had people of so many different faiths and none and women from different sort of backgrounds and we all seemed to gel really well together. And I think that came down to the support from Halima, myself, Emma, who also worked with us. And the backup that we, we all gave each other. So we had, we sort of, all right, oh, so-and-so, you know, needs help. How can I do this? And we, we text each other in the background. So we had, I think, knowing that Halima had this, idea I wanted to run with it but run with it in a way that was manageable so sometimes I'd have to say to Halima no we can't do that no nope, can't have that and she'd like oh you know it, it's it's not working for me and we, but we communicated and I think that's the key to making collaboration I mean, it's the first time for both of us to to be working together like this but communication and patience was key in making this project work and it wasn't perfect there are challenges of working and other people managing you know or producing the whole thing and it's 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 very different to you sort of making the decisions for yourself so there were some things where we you know you, you'd have to sort of give and take so you know, those, those relationships had some struggles at some, as, you know, in, in some situations. Um, just trying to think if I've missed anything. Oh, Joss. Aisha? Yes. 
I'm going to say thank you very much because thank you. running over time and that was That's totally fun. brilliant. And thank you, thank you so much. I'd just like to say a huge thank you to all the speakers. It's just been really inspiring to sit here and listen to just some great pieces of work and also just thinking about the social impact and change that, that has taken place across the region feels, feels really inspiring. And I think something I wanted to say at the start was the impact of COVID on the arts world has been so immense. And it feels to me that this work that we are engaged with and wanting to do has actually never felt more important and that now is the time I think if we can think how we might come together as a regional network, it, it feels like there's some really exciting and also much needed opportunities for artists and communities to work together. I wonder if somebody from each group might like just to spend a few minutes sharing back some sort of key points from their discussion. And then um, we'll see if there's any sort of more general question and answers at the end and I promise you we will definitely finish on time if not a few minutes earlier. So I wonder if someone maybe from breakout one would like to share some of the points that that came up in their discussion. Which, which one was breakout one Sarah? That was Christina. <laughs> that was Christina's group. Cool. We we kind of covered the, the the kind of question fairly loosely i mean so some of the things that we were thinking about in terms of what we want from a regional co-creation network the possibility of open space and troubleshooting kind of came up building knowledge strength solidarity the possibility of having other practitioners artists producers evaluators non-art people and community members as part of co-creation network felt really exciting the idea that projects could be delivered in various forms across the region joined up working and thinking and increased impact through that kind of sharing felt exciting the idea of sharing best practice at a regional level the idea of workshops training sharing practice skills and development opportunities all felt really exciting and also thinking about how people might influence this network so in in a, in, in a way we've already covered kind of artists organizations communities and how is power held in that network and how is that part of the structure um, and one kind of like possible pitfall we we kind of like came up against or, or just things to be aware of is that the, the southwest as a region is huge and the and the places within it range from super urban to, to kind of super rural as well and it can stretch all the way from Hampshire across to Land's End in Cornwall so it kind of a, a network needs to be able to hold kind of diversity of place in it and that is the stuff that we kind of covered. Oh, sharing stories as well. We felt like that was really important. Who's Who was breakout room two? I think that was my group. Would anyone, we were just about to decide who was gonna share back and then the, <laughs> The breakout room ended. Would anyone from my group like to share? I think it's down to you, Martha. It sounds like, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we had a really good. Go, Fiona. Yeah, go, go for yeah. it. Um, I can summarize, I think, the main points from our conversation quite quickly and then I'll move on to the uh, Jamboard. So we thought that the, the best things that we could um, hope to achieve from, from the network would be learning from each other. We thought it would be just amazing to, to have access to the wealth of knowledge that this group of people would have and also to share opportunities to work uh, with each other 
and Martha asked us for any good examples of networks that have managed to sustain themselves because there was a there was a reflection from someone in the group that sometimes these things have so much energy at the beginning and then that can sometimes peter out after a while and we we ran out of time but I managed to share that there's a a network an informal network of women professionals who work in the built environment called Urban Easters who have managed to develop a really successful model and I'm just taking a look at our really busy jam board right now so different ideas of how we're already connecting and working together by sitting on boards for other organizations there was also something someone shared about being a freelancer and how that had given them how the the movement that that necessitates in in their work allows them to tap into a wider network of co-producers co-creators there was mention of the association of collaborative designers and yeah we also had a bit of discussion around how it would be great if freelancers could be paid for the amount of net or for any networking that they do because obviously this represents unpaid unpaid work um I don't think we got to the bottom of where, where that uh, resource might come from. There are loads and loads of post-it notes on this board. Uh, so I don't think I'm going to share any more of them. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, that's so a little flavour. Martha, how many breakout rooms have we got? How many did we Seven. Have? Seven. Okay, I'm going to ask everyone who goes henceforth to to do it super quick because I'd like to make sure that we finish at seven o'clock. I know that's a bit mean, but yeah, I'm going to I'm going to have my stopwatch on. So if somebody from breakout room three would like to just summarise their main points, that would be that would be amazing. That's Hannah's group, I think. Yeah, if anybody wants to go, raise your hand from my group. Oh, I like I'm liking the energy in this. This is great. <laughs> okay. okay, I can't see any hands. All right, cool. So we got. How are we already connecting? Maybe not feeling that connected, but this is a great connection, okay, creating change and a lot, lots of connections through online platforms and stuff and coming together through like arts and community centers. So that's our like sticking point. And what could, what kind of support could a regional network offer? Came up with some ideas, places to learn about others like financial models and maybe where they're getting funds from thinking about there was like a, an, a new idea about having a co-creation theory reading group or network with maybe some kind of like central resource a bank or something stuff to do with having a network where we can't find stuff locally, maybe we can go further afield to find it. Then um, let's say, how could we connect and work better together? We want to come together in real life as well as online. And um, we want to work with diverse set of people with diverse values and stuff to do with like diversifying skills and maybe like handing on the baton. So like different people, whether you're an artist or like organization or are the different groups or community members I think different people can hold the baton so that sorry lights gone off so that not uh, everyone can kind of get a say for what's important what we need to talk about and like organization Stefan like taking everyone taking those ah, skills Hannah I'm going to be super yeah no that's cool that's cool I thought you cut me off earlier so no, thank no, you no, I'll Great thank Great. stop the time for training. Thank you so much. I'm going to just do a whistle stop tour of what our group spoke about. I think 
one of the first points was about making sure this was a southwest thing and i asked the question should it just be, should the southwest be divided it was like absolutely not let's start off definitely as an entire region and how much not support but how much Cornwall and Devon and Dorset definitely really want to be part of this. So how can we be a regional network? And then we spoke about diversity and making sure that diverse voices were really included and that trust and support and respect felt really important. There was discussions about having been in networks and feeling a bit of an imposter maybe and that the same people were always in the room and wanting to feel that it was a safe space. And then also a reflection that when you that those spaces need to be really well facilitated and we had a bit of a conversation about where does leadership sit within that in the role of co-creation but also make, yeah, making, making sure that everyone feels safe and then we also spoke about barriers to funding and how people find it quite hard sometimes to access funding and maybe this idea of setting up a network might enable a network to be able to distribute funding in a way that's easier for particularly for grassroots organisations and yeah, and freelance artists. That's a whistle stop. Can I hand over to somebody from group number five? Sally, I think. Sorry, would anyone in our group like to do the sharing? Go, Sally. Okay, all right. Well, so yeah, just quickly then. So we talked about we talked about the mechanism of Zoom actually being, first of all, being, being really helpful for kind of bringing the whole region together in, in a sort of really inclusive way because, you know, suddenly you can have really kind of efficiently people from, in our group, we had Somerset to, from Dev, Somerset, Devon, South Gloucestershire all kind of represented. But also to be mindful that whilst in some ways that is more inclusive, it can also be not inclusive for, for some communities. And so just to be mindful of that and to think about how we get around those problems. For it being a really important, for, for, for the network to be a really important space for sharing best practice and, you know, having kind of all points on the scale of experience represented being really important because it means that you've got lots of people to, to learn from that are kind of close to, to, to where you are in your journey. We talked about personal well-being and sto sharing stories being really important for personal well-being as well and kind of, you know, helping people understand how they can manage different situations and diff um, different personalities. And also just stories being inspiring. We also talked about the need for toolkits and shared resources, you know, if anything from kind of risk management, risk assessment templates to information on how to navigate a council the kind of information that people don't necessarily um, admit to not knowing the way around, but actually confuses most people. And so, yeah, so about the kind of information sharing that's, that's kind of beyond the sort of art centre and more into the kind of community social sector information that's really important for us all to share. Uh, blah, 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 blah. anything else anything else really important that I've missed there guys I mean we talked about a lot more than that I'm just being we have yeah. got the brilliant jam boards that we can that we will definitely take everything from well, yeah I think we're the last to go happy if I just say it and then just say anything I've missed my group yeah cool so we talked about what's working at the moment in terms of connections and a lot of the kind of mutual aid and connection is very hyper local. So we talked a lot about what's really adding value at the regional level, what's special about regional and kind of some answers to that one. It's sometimes easier to be more honest when people aren't quite so close to you. And so it's safer space to fail and talk about that could be good. And then the other thing is like, you don't know what you don't know. So be able to reach beyond your kind of like known network at a more regional scale, you might have access to some different variety of knowledge, tools and kit, which would be really good. Don't forget intimacy, Zoom is great, but you know, we didn't even know this thing existed before the 8th of March last year. And so really kind of building the intimacy and connection and realness and everything we're doing and the practicality and the hands-on stuff, really, really important. And then finally, the ethics of co-creation, you know, there's this it's a hugely generous practice at its heart, but, you know, we need to protect ourselves from kind of, uh, you're shy about saying the word, but exploitation, and making sure that we're taking a care of that and kind of our ideas as well, that we can go happily and carry on with that generous spirit. 
Anyone else from my group want to add in? That was brilliant. Thank you so much, particularly the last few speakers who I'm sure felt my stopwatch going. I'm just, I think we're going to go a minute over. So if you can indulge me, I would just like to say thank you to all our contributors this evening. And just also what a wealth of amazing people there are here this evening. And I'm sure this is only a snapshot of what exists in the Southwest. And um, it feels like a really exciting opportunity to maybe look at what a regional network might, might offer. And I think, in fact, I'm going to hand back to Strike a Light and Noel West because this is not my event. And yeah, just for you guys to think about next steps and how BAC can support that because it just feels like there's so much here. So I'd like to say a huge thank you. And I'm going to hand back to Christina and Martha to close the event. I'm just going to put in the chat, you'll have had this on email as well, and we'll send it out afterwards, but there's a link there. So if you want to sign up for updates and be part of kind of creating what comes next, then we'd love to keep in touch with you through that. And we'll take all the stuff from the jam boards, but also if there's other stuff you want to follow up with on email or anything like that, that would be awesome. Martha, do you want to add stuff? Just, just a massive thank you all for all your generous contributions and your time. It's been, yeah, I found it really inspiring evening. And yes, it feels like just the beginning. Like we just scratched the surface and we could, we could hear from all of you to hear about all of your wonderful work. And we will gather up all of the, all of the thoughts from tonight and um, share recordings and notes and things. And we just hope that this is the start of more connecting and more more of this. I, I meant to signpost people. If you want to go to the Co-Creating Change website, there's events and newsletters and all lots of lots of hopefully good and interesting articles, etc. And we have got an event next week which is about a sort of a beginner's guide to co-creation. So if anyone's interested in that, please sign up. Tickets, even though they're free, are going really fast. So it's two minutes past seven. We haven't gone too much over. Thanks so much. And I really hope that this is something that can, can grow in the Southwest and feels really exciting.